Hey guys, Brian Beeler here with Storage Review on our first ever live stream. I've got Chris Moore is with us today from iX Systems. Uh, Chris, you're a VP of engineering there, right? Yes, indeed. All right, so tell me about iX Systems and how that relates to TrueNAS and FreeNAS and what just sure. articulate the relationship so, for us. iX Systems has been around for quite a while. Um, we're the company behind a lot of open source projects. Open source is kind of in our blood, so to speak. Uh, many years back, we adopted the FreeNAS project and took over ownership of that and primary development and uh, been developing it ever since. And over time, FreeNAS developed into the enterprise product TrueNAS. And then uh, one thing led to another. And here we are today to talk about the unification where we finally bring the two brands and products back together as one yeah. in uh, TrueNAS Core 12. Well, we're excited about it. We have, uh, or had, so we've done a little work already. Yeah. We had FreeNAS 11.3 installed on our IX box that we mm -hmm. used for the Asegra work that we've uh, published before. And earlier today, you popped up from Knoxville. Mm -hmm. You brought some lovely IPAs. Had we, to, right? We, we had that conversation <laughs> in the podcast, which is, uh, in terms of time sync, we did the podcast yep. already. It'll come out tomorrow, so check that out on Spotify or iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts if you want hot Knoxville IPA beer talk. Um, <laughs> but we also got into uh, some of the new features and functionality, but before that, we did update our mm -hmm. system. So we're running the the uh, TrueNAS Core nightly bits. We're we as are. current as we can be at the moment. Yeah, this build is from last night, so that's about as bleeding edge as you get. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> brace for impact, everyone. This is, this is uh, live, never before tested, uh, at least not by us. And uh, Kevin's already been messing with the system. We, we yanked out two hard drives. We put in a couple SSDs, which we'll get to as one of the, uh, the new features. Yeah, be one of the demos we do. Yeah, yeah. So this is also the first ever, is this right? The first ever TrueNAS 12? This is the first review or demo, live demo we've done of Core. I mean, we haven't even hit beta yet. We're still a good three to four weeks what, out from what that. Could go, what so. could go wrong? This should be fantastic. <laughs> Uh, why don't we just get into it and, sure. and start to highlight some of those features, flip over to the interface, and then okay. uh, uh, we'll, we'll see what's up with the, uh, the new Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. Let's see if I can do the keystrokes there. So for those following along, uh, as you mentioned, we already did the upgrade. We decided not to show that here because, frankly, it's not that exciting. You click a couple buttons and you go get coffee and come back and it's done. So anyway, needless to say, this is post-upgrade. We've upgraded to the nightly image from last night. We're just gonna go ahead and start right at the beginning here. So we're logging into TrueNAS Core 12. And as you can see, if you're running 11.3, you know, a lot of the similar UI is here. There's been little visual improvements throughout. But what we really wanna focus today on is some of the new features that 12 is bringing to the table and just kind of giving a live uh, walkthrough of that. Yeah, and so while we're looking at the features, if you're on the YouTube uh, stream, if you have questions or comments or thoughts, go ahead and, uh, and, and type those in for us and we'll respond to those as we can in line. Um, and to be just clear, like this is, this system is on and idle, but it's not taking load right now while we're doing yeah. this. So we're just sort of here to, to show the features and, and capabilities. We'll, we'll look at some performance angles a little yeah. bit later once Kevin gets his hands on this thing. Absolutely. We're just messing around right now. I mean, we don't even have a pool created yet. So there's, look at that. there's right all, from the all beginning. sorts of upside. We're, yeah. we're, we're bare naked. Let's go. So we're going to get started here. One of the first new features we wanted to demo, and pardon me while I name our pool tank, you know, the classic uh, Z pool name here. Um, one of the features we want to talk about and demonstrate first is fusion pools. So this is a new feature coming in 12. And to give you a little background before I finish setting it up here, the idea is, is you typically have your, your pools, you'll have spinning disk, you might have all SSD pools and you, know, you mix and match. Starting with 12, you have the ability now to create kind of a, a fusion or hybrid pool, if you will, of spinning disks for data blocks. And then if you want to put uh, metadata on flash devices specifically to speed up all the metadata operations, you can now do that in 12. So I'm going to demonstrate real quick how simple that is just for the sake of uh, brevity here. We're not going to go and set up all the disks. We're going to go ahead and just put a mirrored pair in here, and then we're going to add a new special metadata allocation. Oh, there we go. Class It's right there. Yeah, and we've talked about this before. The nice thing about having the metadata on Flash is that most of the requests that a system like this will see are for metadata, mm -hmm. not necessarily the file itself. Yeah. A lot of metadata operations. So the more you can do to put that on your faster media, the better, and uh, you know, still get the economy of having spinning media in the same pool. Okay, let's go ahead and create these. Give it a moment. It's we're already getting formatting. We're already getting the first question. You knew what it was going to be on, didn't you? No, I didn't. What was it? Scale. 
right. <laughs> we'll get to that. We're going to get to we'll that. We'll get to that. Look, we're going to get through this demo first, but uh, we got some stuff to show you. And a lot of this, all, matter of fact, all of this is going to apply to scale as well. So right. hold so, your horses. So Tom, you settle down, buddy. We'll get there. <laughs> anyway, so that was pretty much it. All we had to do to go ahead and create a fusion pool. It was honestly an extra two or three clicks just to create an extra device, put a couple you know, flash devices in there and go. Uh, at that point, we're all set up. And now all of our metadata is on flash just to show you what that looks like here. Right, and just from a functional standpoint, all we did was was pull two of the hard drives. Kevin slammed a couple uh, SAS SSDs, mm -hmm. I think, in there. But this will work SAS systems that support NVMe. Yeah. What else? Any kind of flash device that the system will recognize. So NVMe, SAS. Okay. Uh, we have NVDIMs in our M series products, so right. potentially other devices could be okay. used as well. Cool. Um, so as you can see here, we just created a simple mirror of two spinning disks, and then now we have this special allocation class type, which is comprised of the two SSDs that we fed it. Um, so what the special allocation class does, in addition to metadata, it can also store dedupe tables and small block I.O. So if you have a lot of small I.O., you could potentially have that funneled to the faster SSD okay. storage as well. Great. So let's uh, go back to pools here. Okay, for our next feature, we want to walk through real quick, and this is one I've been wanting for years that we finally have coming out in 12, is the ability to have native encryption. And by native, what I mean is not at the disk level, not necessarily said, but actual true ZFS aware native encryption at the data set level. And we'll get into why that's important here in a moment, but let's go ahead and start by creating a data set. And we'll just call it a, help if I can see the screen, crypto. While you're thinking about that, you know, security is obviously an increasingly important concern. Is it, are you seeing awareness of, of these issues all the way down to SMBs or is it really the service providers that are facilitating this? What uh, Everyone is on board. It seems like we're getting, even from home users, security is really a big concern. And one of the features that having native encryption is going to allow you to do, one of the reasons I'm really looking forward to it is replication encryption. So. Right now, when you replicate, it can be over SSH. That's encrypted over the wire. Fantastic. But what about on the remote side? Well, your data is still stored in an unencrypted format, so right. you have to trust the remote host. Using native encryption, that's no longer uh, something you have to worry about. It's possible to replicate your encrypted data sets or ZVols or whatever to a remote system that you don't necessarily have control over and don't necessarily have to implicitly trust. You do not have to send the keys over with the replication which means you can store your data there. It's fully encrypted. You can replicate it back. And then, then at that point, bring the keys and unlock it. Or okay. in this case, I'm going to use a passphrase. But that's a, that's a big deal for a lot of us because a lot of times we don't control the backup target directly. So we've just made a data set called crypto. We've added a passphrase to it. And you'll note, uh, yeah, don't change my password. I know it's not a fancy password. <laughs> Um, you're going to see some new icons here. This is a little different from 11.3, for example. So you'll see the root uh, pool data set here is, uh, doesn't have a lock button. It's X'd out or crossed out there. But the crypto file system is encrypted, and you can see it's unlocked now. That means it's mounted, it's available, it's active. So I'm able to, via the UI now, do things like going in and locking it. So let's go ahead and confirm that we want to lock that data set. And it's now locked. It's basically unavailable and won't be uh, available again until we provide the passphrase to bring it back. So there's a, uh, a question actually on encryption sure. uh, around overhead. So a lot of times when we think about any ad advanced data features, compression, dedupe, all sorts mm -hmm. of things like, along those lines, and then uh, encryption as well, yeah. are, are we taking much of a hit in terms of system performance? Well, here? yeah, there's going to be a little bit of a performance hit. There always is when you go and add another step in the right. pipeline, if you will. Um, the nice thing about the native encryption is for those who have used previous uh, disk-based encryption like Jelly, our software encryption, you were paying that penalty per drive. So as you added more drives, the penalty got steeper because you were having to encrypt on each device independently. What's nicer about this is you're paying the penalty once. Mm -hmm. And then irregardless of how many drives you have, those encrypted bits will be funneled out to the necessary VDEVs in the end. So it should be a lot more performant, especially as you scale up. Okay. Okay, so with that, I've been able to add an encrypted data set, you know, un lock it, unlock it, et cetera. All the options are there. There's cool features for doing nested, so you can have an encrypted data set and then nest unencrypted on top of that or nest other encrypted data sets with different credentials, different passwords. So you can get as crazy as you want, and uh, it should uh, take it with no sweat. Okay, so 
next up here, yeah, unless you have any other questions. We did get one more right before we were about to skip okay. forward. Go for it. Will AES and I help? Yes. If, if you have AES and I, which most modern processors do, that will just be automatically utilized. Well, so. you said the word processor, so that's not relevant to the current demo, but I'll go back because we mm -hmm. did get hit on this. Uh, we've got a question around support for AMD. So Epic, Ryzen, that yeah. sort of thing. Um, there, it looks like there's been some speculation about more deeper support there. 12 brings a lot of that to the table already. A lot of those work on 11.3, but it was definitely optimized and made more performant on 12. So if you're on some of the later generation Ryzen's or Threadrippers, you know, Epics, yeah. um, 12 is definitely what you're going to want to upgrade to. Sooner yeah. Do you, later. do you have any feel for how AMD is doing in, in this sort of product for you? Or is, I assume it's mostly we, Intel, but it's a lot of Intel, but we're seeing more and more of our community and enthusiast builds sure. absolutely starting to switch to AMD. I mean, price and performance and all that. Well, so. Absolutely. On the, from the Epic standpoint, the, mm -hmm. the CPU pricing is pretty aggressive. Yeah. So getting 12 out the door, being able to support or better support some of the AMD platform is going to be important for us. All right, carry on. Okay, so another feature, which was one that's been requested for many, many years now. Let me set the table a little bit here. So a lot of folks who deploy FreeNAS or now TrueNAS Core uh, often want to be able to get to their files or get to their SMB shares or their services while away from the home. And not everyone we find has the VPN infrastructure set up on their networking gear to do that. So a request we've had for years has been adding some sort of VPN support natively to the product. So I'm pleased to announce that with 12, we've done that. OpenVPN has now been added in uh, two flavors, so we can actually run it in client or server mode, which is okay. really cool. So if you have an existing OPN, OpenVPN infrastructure, you can plug into it as a client, great. If you don't, you want to actually host the OpenVPN uh, network on your TrueNAS, you can do that hmm. now as well. So uh, I don't know how your network's set up here, and I'm not going to go set it all up, but just to show you. Don't worry. Yeah. Kevin's in charge of the network, right. which okay. means it's set up <laughs> haphazardly and most likely built for disaster. Well, I will try not to break you guys, but no, I'm, I'm not going to go set it all up. Just to, just to demonstrate the options are here. You can go ahead and, and set them up the way you want and then enable them just like you would any other service like SMB or NFS. It's just an option you turn on and then when the system reboots, it comes back and reconnects or restarts the server depending on how, how your setup was done. Yeah, that's, that's pretty unique. Do you have any sense? Well, talk a little bit about how you got there on, mm -hmm. on OpenVPN and what some of the other use case drivers? I mean, obviously you talked about simplicity of network setup, but you know, it's you know, it's for simplicity and network setup. We have folks who, again, they're, they're remote. Maybe they want to watch their Plex or access their media or whatever locally over SMB, but they're away from the house. That's fine. People travel. Some people are using it to share with family members and friends who aren't necessarily at the home, mm -hmm. and they don't have a other VPN technology set up. Enterprises typically have their own VPN set sure. up, which is great. You know, we encourage you to use that whenever you can. But for those who don't or can't use it, or heck, we've seen some r weird situations where people take systems mobile, hmm. like actually out with a generator and are doing stuff like video recording. Yeah, well, out, we, we see that too. Out in the too. wild, yeah, so yeah. to speak, where they can't bring all the extra network gear. So having something like this where you can open VPN in and then the person at the office can pull down files from the share, that's right. an option as well. Okay, cool. So... Anyway, that's, that's an exciting one. Glad to see that finally land because that's been something many people have requested over the years. So You've got a lot of things you're excited about. I in am. This I mean, there's this is a good release. We've been working on this for <laughs> a year and a half now. I mean, we've been working on a lot of stuff in parallel. Even before 11.3 was out, we were still working on 12 features. So right. it's been a long time coming. Um, next feature is, for those who don't know, since we've switched to the new UI and starting in 11.3, everything, I mean everything that you can do in the UI is fully API driven. So anything you can see here or you can do here, you could easily talk to a REST API or WebSockets API, um, uh, connection to be able to access our APIs and drive the TrueNAS rig around. So uh, for those who don't know, let's see, we have API keys in here now. That is what we a feature we've added to 12. So no longer having to share your root password to the box, which is kind of handy. Mm -hmm. Not everyone felt good doing that. But we can go in here and create one time or, you know, a key you can continuously use, but only display it the first time. But at this point, you can now drive the API fully around using an API key. Once they're created, they get listed in here. You can name them, give them a nickname, and then revoke them later. For the variety of use cases yeah. where you might drive those. Exactly. And we're seeing more and more people do that, too. I've seen 
bunch of Python scripts pop up on GitHub, for example, where people have things to go set up a bunch of shares or set up a bunch of users or just automate the, the TrueNAS experience. So this is something we wanted to give to that crowd to make it a little bit more convenient and how you would typically drive an API around. So when you think about the API functionality, do you see that more as an initial setup and configuration issue? Do you see some use cases where it could be an ongoing maintenance thing? Like what? It can be it can be a variety. Some folks use it in initial setup, but there's some folks who are doing a lot of tasks, you know, rolling new shares pretty frequently or adding users. So they may tie it into their existing infrastructure. So if you already have a tool that adds users for your business, for example, you can now tie a script in, which then goes and provisions their share at the same time or mm -hmm. sets something up special on the storage form. Okay. So definitely handy to have available. Okay. Well, so, I, well, I've also noticed, by the way, everything you're doing is through the GUI, which yeah, is... Uh, I am. Well, I'm going <laughs> to use it here. I'm not going to go do it through the API live demo. <laughs> no, no but I mean, everything, you know, for me, I'm not, I'm not a CLI wizard like mm -hmm. you are, and, you know, Kevin likes to mess around in there, so... For for the more novice user, the fact that it's all in the uh, in the GUI too yeah. so far is uh, is nice to see. Absolutely, absolutely. So it's great that you can do this all, but we want to provide because there's a lot of us like myself who prefer command line. And yeah. if you want to look at JSON all day, we can do a different talk about that. Sometime. No, I'm good. <laughs> okay, I'm good. <laughs> Okay, so moving on, uh, this one I'm not going to show, but just mention we did add another feature for 12 for uh, enterprise specifically, KMIP support. So for those who don't know, that's key management. So 12 enterprise will have the ability to talk to uh, KMIP servers and be able to record and request access to things like said drive keys, data set encryption keys, uh, things of that nature. Okay, uh, last feature I think I'll show off here will be this little fancy icon that showed up here. So this is something I don't think we've really announced or talked much about yet. Ooh, top secret, I like True it. True Command Cloud is coming. So for those who don't know, we have our True Command, Command companion product. Say that three times mm. fast. Um, True Command is basically a single pane of glass uh, experience for TrueNAS. So if you're deploying or running multiple TrueNAS units in the field, True Command is your one tool which can talk to all of them, monitor all of them, help you manage all of them. It also supports things like RBAC, so you can have multiple administrators have access to True Command, and you're not handing out just credentials to all your storage to just right. everyone on the team. You can restrict things or set up controls the way you want your team to administrate the boxes. So uh, starting with 12, we're going to be debuting True Command, True Command Cloud, which is IX hosted. It'll be a service you can sign up for, and uh, built right into the GUI, you'll have an, a, a way to go ahead and connect to it. Basically, after you've made a cloud instance, there's mm -hmm. just an API key you paste here, and then you connect. Will that be available before 12 as for yes. the beta users to yeah. be able to? We want to also debut it and have it in beta as well right. at the same time. So beta users so can start follow signing it up. A similar schedule. Most likely. We, okay. may, we may release the cloud officially a little before 12 officially launches sure. if it's stable and ready and all that. But we at least want people to start kicking the tires, testing it out, getting us feedback as we go through the beta process. And is 12 required for that or will that be backward? To for the moment, it's only in 12. Okay. We've talked about maybe backporting it to 11.3, but we want to get through the beta cycle at 12 sure. first. So uh, that is definitely coming as well. That's an exciting feature. Um, other things not that I can't necessarily show, and I'll just switch back to the video here, see if I can remember. Aha, there we go. Got it. We're back. So, um, of course, with 12, there's the slew of performance improvements, you know, vectorized checksums, the bringing the new ZFS from ZFS on Linux to 12 just brings a whole goodie bag of little improvements here and there, performance tweaks. FreeBSD 12 also has some performance improvements, especially on systems with lots of cores. So we're expecting to see some uh, further performance wins there. So those are all good reasons to upgrade. And in addition, you know, the usual couple hundred tickets we put in to go and change things in the UI, tweak sure. things, clean them up, make things more uh, easily usable, and add some more advanced functionality. So okay. um, almost too many to go through. If you want to look at our Jira ticket track. Oh, we got time. Let's, you're let's, welcome to do that let's some other the time. Tickets and <laughs> go, one, go one by one down those I don't need boys. to look at tickets today. <laughs> that, that's every other day. <laughs> All right. So there's there's a, a question in about FreeNAS Mini yeah. would, would become TrueNAS Core Mini. Is that... Yep. Is that the right logic? I, I guess, yeah, that's what we're going to end up calling it. So you'll load TrueNAS Core on your FreeNAS Mini and start calling it a TrueNAS Mini. Oh, all right. Well, there you go, Leroy. Uh, Blaze has got a question. Will True Command have a free tier? Yes. So True Command, the way it's priced is uh, anything below 50 disks it's managing is free. Okay. So for most home users, home lab environments, that's usually more than enough disks. I mean, once you start getting above fifty, your situation yeah. here in the yeah, office, we're is a about different. fifty. No, yeah. I was thinking of the the uh, the data hoarder subreddit. Fifty might uh, there might uh, some people might be bumping up against. I'm sure that. there's several. So but, uh, 
but that that's where the tier starts anyway okay. to give you a chance to try it you know get used to it and see if it works in your infrastructure a couple of the nice features it brings that i know users have requested is configuration backup so i, okay. I don't know if you've used freenas long enough yet to know but freenas everything is stored in a config database mm -hmm. so the idea being if say your uh, say your boot drive dies for some reason you know flash it wears out it happens or spinning yeah. disc happens. Happens, it happens all the time actually so we always recommend to people they back up their freenas config or now truenas core config and should that happen you can reinstall fresh re-import the database and you're good you don't have to go set up your shares again you can just import the pool and you know keep on trucking. Um, TrueNet or True Command has the ability to automatically back that up. In addition to the ability to audit the database for changes and tell you when and where and who made changes, it will then, when it detects changes to the configuration database, automatically take a snapshot of it, back it up and store it on True Command. So okay. you can just within a click, download it, redeploy it, and you don't have to worry about manually remembering to back that up anymore in the okay. future. So sure. that's definitely a handy one. I, I'm using it for that already. Already saved my butt once. Okay, <laughs> good. Uh, so Tom hit you on it right out of the gate and you know, I've talked about it on mm -hmm. the podcast already. You excited a lot of the world earlier this week with this, yep. uh, your, uh, your scale announcement and you aggravated or, or maybe had, had some people that were confused. So mm -hmm. it, that's not the purpose of today's broadcast, but dive into scale a little bit and tell us a, a little this more was about a busy that. news week for us. I know There's a lot was, of stuff that good. happened. So it's good. We're, we've been talking about a lot of things. So scale, we announced this week. Um, just to kind of lay the table here. So scale, obviously we're talking about scale out is one of the big features we've been talking about for years. We, you know, at what point do we bring some sort of scale out technology into FreeNAS or now mm -hmm. TrueNAS? So uh, TrueNAS scale is the answer to that, where we're gonna be starting to bring scale out in uh, using still ZFS as the base and building on top of that. But uh, in addition to that, and probably the news that was getting some people excited or controversial is the fact that it's built off of Linux. So it's a uh, Debian based mm -hmm. as opposed to BSD based. And with that, we are probably the most popular request we've gotten over the years has been uh, Docker support, Nat right. like native true Docker support. So this gives us the ability to also offer native Docker. And then of course, KVM for people who want to run VMs and just a, a slew of other little things that people want in that ecosystem. So uh, we're, Working hard on it, that's not available yet. We're planning on some nightlies probably closer to the end of this month, uh, about the time the beta for core goes out. And when I say nightlies, I mean this is pre, 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 pre alpha type stuff. Very so early. Very, very early, but we wanna get it out there. We're an open source company. We've published all the source code. People, are not, actually, I know at least a few have already built uh, scale images and run them locally to test. But we want to get that into people's hands, into developers' hands. We're actually calling it a technical preview mm -hmm. because we want people to try it out, give us feedback uh, if there's things they want to contribute on or hack on. Sometimes people have ideas that we haven't even thought of yet, and we encourage that kind of dialogue. So we're going to get it out there and go through the typical open source process where we put it out for a while, let it mature, and then eventually cut a release. What do you think is going to be most exciting about what that opportunity affords you in terms of features and functionality? Well, it depends on your use case, right? Obviously, if you're enterprise, the scale out is going to be the yeah. key. I mean, ZFS is fantastic at scale up and you can scale up big, but having scale out, being able to do some things like active active and do a true cluster is important. So on the enterprise side, those that's going to make those guys happy. Yeah, I'm I'm curious to see where you go on the on the concept of hyperconverge with this thing. Yeah. Like you the world is open now in, mm -hmm. in terms of what you put together from a hardware standpoint, what you can do with KVM. There's so much capability oh, yeah. there. It should so be it's a very mature very exciting. Very mature technology. There's a lot there that we can do now. Uh, KVM, so I was gonna say the other side of the coin is of course containers and hyperconverge. Right. So I think there's a ton of folks out there I know because I see the requests, believe me, I read Reddit, <laughs> I watch our forums who want to run native Docker, run things you know, like Plex with GPU, run GPU pass through to KVM contain, uh, VMs. Having those capabilities is a big deal for a large segment of our community. So I, I know there's gonna be a lot of interest there. So we've got a, a container question Container storage Shoot. interface in the works, CSI in the works. Um, we're kicking some ideas around right now. <laughs> I'm not, I won't say just yet. I, we have a couple ideas we're batting around okay. on, on what we may do. There's a couple paths we can go on that. We're trying to decide how much we want to reinvent wheels versus versus, versus integrate something existing. Yeah, so we're kicking the idea, the tires on a few different ideas right now. That's as much as I can say till we at least make a decision. How about uh, beehive changes or feature upgrades? So 12 does bring some beehive changes. Um, not a, a 
big one off the top of my head that I would announce for 12. Stability improvements, of course. Uh, some fixes to allow it to run more modern uh, Linux uh, uh, con- uh, VMs as well. Mm-hmm. So that'll definitely be one. Um, just, yeah, minor changes for sure. It, and it's evolving a little bit with each release. Okay. There's, there's a question I want to get to here in a minute, but I think I want to get you to clarify the difference uh, uh, between core and enterprise. Yes. So reset that for us, and then I'll ask you this question. Okay. So core and enterprise, and let's go back to the unification announcement, which we made a couple months back, if I recall. Um, we, of course, have had FreeNAS. We've had TrueNAS, FreeNAS being the free community thing. Everyone sure. downloads. That's what most of you guys are here for, most likely to hear about. And then we have TrueNAS, which is the thing that pays the bills. It's our awesome enterprise product. It's mm-hmm. it's the thing that IX Systems is really proud to put their name on. Well, for those who don't know, it's a lot of work to maintain two separate products that are almost functionally identical. Right. I mean, it's the same code base, plus or minus some bits on each side. Um, but you end up basically having to do two QA cycles two release engineering cycles, two documentation cycles, um, even sometimes two sets of code to maintain to be able to ship two products which functionally do a lot of the same thing, right? right? So in the run-up to 12, it's something that had been in the back of our mind anyway was the rebrand of FreeNAS. And with that came the conversation of, man, wouldn't it be great if we could have this all in one image and not have to pay that double penalty every single time? So... With 12, we've done that. It's a single image. You install at its core. If you're on IX platforms, you know, our M series, our X series, it'll detect that. You apply a license key and it unlocks the TrueNAS Enterprise features, you know, fiber channel, the the, uh, UI-driven enclosure management, for Mm -hmm. example, proactive support, HA, of course, is a big feature. Um, So that's how it works, but it's just going to help streamline and simplify the process for our team, which actually gives us the cycles to go do something like a TrueNAS scale. I mean... It's a lot of effort to go spin up a new project like well, that. Well, sure. yeah, the efficiency benefits are obvious. Absolutely. So this question is more about the differentiation and feature set mm-hmm. between the two. And I think you started to hit on, yeah. on some of that, uh, like the Active Active, which only you can control properly in your environment. So that makes sense. Uh, this one's around SAS SSDs. Um, dual port SAS is a feature that's available on existing free NAS, is it being phased out in true, to be true NAS enterprise only? We're not changing any of the existing functionality that's in free NAS, so if it's there, it's gonna stay. Okay. Um, obviously, the supported enterprise version has its own bits that will take advantage of certain things like okay. that for doing HA, for example. But uh, any of the features you have in free NAS now are there in true NAS core. We've not removed anything, let me assure folks, because a few people did ask about that when we made the announcement, which I don't blame them. Well, yeah, if there, it's a natural the, question. If you if you've got a big install base yeah. that's on dual port SAS, mm-hmm. and if that were to go, away, that would be a problem. Yeah, or, yeah, or concern at least. Yep. All right, uh, any plans for UI support for setup of IC or RDMA on scale? Not to announce at this time. Um, that may happen down the road, but we haven't gotten to that point yet. Like I said, we're still in the very early days of scale. We got quite a long road ahead of us before we get to a release point, but I. Let me say I could imagine seeing some of those show up in okay. the UI at some point. There you go. In okay. a, in a, he's got an imagination on well, him, no, right? <laughs> I don't want to commit to firm it's going to be there on day one on the launch or whatever just yet until we're farther along. All right. I'll give you – because <laughs> scale is all the rage on, a, on okay. this. Um, yeah, I probably what, should look. Huh? What would the mig- migration process be to go from – core to scale have you i know so it's early but have you thought it's about early that? we've had some discussions about that so one thing we do know for sure is and part of the reason we did the pool up or the zfs upgrade for 12 for core is that it's the same zfs that we're going to have on scale it's the same open zfs base on both platforms so we know for sure it'll be possible to up um, install scale and import the pool so mm-hmm. all your data comes with so that's fantastic We've kicked the idea around about having a migration as well, a wizard that allows you to go from scale to core, from core to scale, back and forth. Because for those who haven't read or seen any of the details, we are intentionally keeping the code as close as possible. Matter of fact, they're running out of the exact same code repo right now for both products Mm -hmm. so that we don't have that drift so that it opens up the door to doing things like that. So the same configuration could potentially apply on core versus scale. Obviously, some things won't cleanly translate over. You don't have jails on scale. You have docker containers and mm-hmm. vice versa so sometimes there may be certain things you have to reset up but you know your core components your smbs your nfs is your iSCSIs. we're going to try and make that as painless as possible uh, you've got a kubernetes csi plugin would be great thumbs up so 
suggestion. Okay, okay. Keep those coming. Uh, will IX implement long-term support for enterprise customers? Yeah, long-term supported branch. That's something we've kicked around ideas on right now. We mm-hmm. do maintain the enterprise side a bit longer than we have the, the free now side historically. So how long, it, what, what does that look like now? It's usually like six months longer okay. than we would on the free free now side. And how long is that? Uh, usually a major release is out for 12 to 16 months okay. is supported. Okay. So. All right. Uh, let's see. We've got another AMD. Let's see what we yep. got. I'm glad to hear AMD support is improving. I lost some functionality on my AMD chip upgrading from 11, th- oh, to 11.3 from mm-hmm. 11.2. Uh, correct multi-core function, et cetera. Good luck with your future direction. Oh, well, thank that you. That was nice. That was nice. I appreciate that it. could have gone the other way. Well, we have quite sh- a few people running nightlies now. You could upgrade and give us some feedback. You have boot environments you can roll back. Yeah, All right, there you, you go, Mr. Problem. Ginger. Get on yep. that uh, nightly. It would, it would be good to know, though, if it helps fix, fix the issues you well, saw. What's funny, because I was looking at the uh, truenas.com, I think is the mm-hmm. site, isn't it? And you've got a button there, and it says clicking it. And I'm so used to the corporate world mm-hmm. of of downloads and everything where, oh, okay, well, you need to put your service contract in and oh, your yeah, name, and yeah. you gotta you got to validate everything. You're just showing a directory and telling yeah. people to, to snag it. It's a nightly image, so we, we kind of intentionally don't advertise it too heavily. On. Yeah, well, I am right now. Oh, yeah. Here's right. what you do, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, this is pre-beta. Beta is targeted at the end of the month. If I haven't mentioned yet, June 30th is the date we're shooting for for that. But uh, at this point, the, the nightlies are feature complete. All the features I demoed are in and functional, and we're just in the process of doing QA cycles before we go to beta one. Right. So, so you go to truenas.com. There's a blue button, download TrueNAS core, nightly build, not production ready. You ignore all that. You click the button anyway, and you'll get into the uh, the, the folder structure to be yeah. able to, uh, to just snag Just an ISO bits. file. Just burn it, and away you go. Or pop it on a USB stick. Burn it. Uh, I guess nobody uses What year DVDs is this, anymore, dear right? sir? <laughs> this is true. I've gotten rid of all my optical media. All right. Uh, in core, will there be any storage limit to the number or number of drives? So no, no capacity or drive no. count limit. Nope. Again, it's a functional equivalent of FreeNAS, which didn't have any of that. So, what, it's, what is the upper limit? I know you've got several petabyte clusters out there. <sighs> is there a defined limit? Uh, there's on the software side. There's no defined limit. So it'll go until until your hardware says I can't go no more. Okay. <laughs> well, there you go. You've got uh, you've got a. Uh, an objective to go uh, somebody somebody figure out what that is where you can make the software cry that would be kind of cool yeah. well, i would love to see that right up all right chris can you briefly explain true nas open storage for the community that's just the family name we're using when we say true nas open storage we're talking core so scale enterprise uh, and i guess command part true of command it. you could say is part of that family all right so well. all the trues all the trues are lead. part of true nas open storage all right yes. yep how much of a speed improvement can one expect from making a fusion pool over a regular spinning disk pool? That is a great and tough question to answer because that sounds like well, a question for Kevin to get to work on yeah. this uh, pool we've got created. So right I here. can tell you our performance team's been digging into that, and I guess the the answer is always it's complicated. It depends when you ask on the a workload, performance dep- guy. Depends you know? on the storage. Depends exactly. on the interface. It depends on what you're doing. You know what your use case is. Yeah. You know, are you doing a lot of metadata operations? Do you have a million files in a single directory that you're right. crawling through constantly? If you're all block-based and doing iSCSI, maybe not as much, but if file-based, definitely more of a performance improvement there. So again, it's complicated and it depends. You'll see a performance improvement for sure, but uh, depends on your workload. Okay. We've got uh, another one from Mena. Can you do an OEM for enterprise? And I know you and I talked about that earlier a little bit. That would be cool. We should talk to our product management team about that. Send us an email. Let's talk. All right. Well, this has been really great. I've had a lot of fun going over all the functionality. We've had um, a whole day of, well, yep. a half day of, uh, of IX systems and TrueNAS in here today. Um, we're going to go get our system to work. Kevin's going to do some work. And okay. sounds like Fusion Pool might be the target for our, our yeah. workloads and go see what we can do there. Uh, we've got uh, plenty of flash around and, and plenty of things. I saw to make what you guys work. have back there. I think you can find things to make that go. All right, wait. We got one last one okay. that slipped in under the, the radar. Will it be possible to use the metadata drives also for jails, dockers, instead of just caching? It would be a great uh, addition. That would be a great addition. No, that's not quite how it works. Again, it's down at the ZFS level. It's just looking for meta- metadata to mm-hmm. put on the flash device. So there's no way to say it's all this jail or all this data set. 
Now we have people who do that today and they usually build a second pool, a little small, all flash, a little flash pool. pool. Yeah. yeah. And if you want to put your jails or plugins on that, you can, that's, that's how people have typically gotten around that. Okay. Oh, of course, Tom, <laughs> Tom's coming in with a serious question. <laughs> all right, Tom, I'll, I'll tell you, I was a little late coming in today and, uh, I, I did pull into the, the parking lot here and I was wondering, and I wonder if Chris beat me here. And uh, there was a foreign car in the parking lot. Not that it was made in a foreign country. It was just foreign to our parking lot. And it had uh, Stormtrooper stickers on the back. So no Grateful Dead, but there, uh, there is plenty of uh, of I of got a ner- Star Wars nerd, sticker. Nerd I got stickers. a Full Metal Alchemist sticker. I got my little Unix sticker, my VI sticker, and colon W saves for those who know VI. You might get it. And everyone else just kind of looks cross-eyed at me like, what does that mean? Which is awesome. That's my Unix nerd detector when I'm out in public. Yeah. The w- what percentage of the world would you say? Down where I live, there's not many people <laughs> who get that. You, I was surprised walking into Home Depot one time. Sometime. Really? Yep. Guy was like, oh, so which Unix do you run? I was like, oh, okay. I yeah. like you. Nerd discovered. Yeah, yeah, that was awesome. Nerd discovered. <laughs> All right. Well, Chris, thanks so much for participating in this. The first live stream seems to have gone off with... Uh, uh, little trouble. Yeah, the storms great. passed by, didn't take our power out. Uh, the system worked. Everything was great. So if you've got further questions or comments, uh, hit us up on uh, on any of the social channels. We'll be happy to keep responding and, and help out with uh, any answers. And uh, like I said, Kevin's going to get to work on this, and we'll do Fantastic. a deeper dive on the UI and the new capabilities. And so you'll be hearing from yeah, us. Yeah, love to hear what you find. Very, very soon. Get us some feedback. All right. It's good. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Thanks, everyone.